These several subjects, all of which of course are interrelated, education, scholarship and global civilization. By way of preamble, I would like to draw your attention to one of the distinctive features of our religion, which is the fact that we have as an integral element of the structure of our teachings, the concept of the supremacy of the rule of law. By that I mean that the laws and teachings of our faith are applicable to all members of the Baha'i community irrespective of any other consideration. This is relatively unusual. So often in religious communities, there are certain individuals who rightly or wrongly feel themselves excused from some aspects of their teachings by virtue of either their rank, their social standing, or some other consideration. Whereas in our religion, there are a number of universal principles applicable without a distinction to all. I want to spend a few minutes before getting into the meat of my subject, I want to spend a few minutes exploring a few of those universally applicable principles. And I think they can be gathered together under the heading of the enlightened mind. We are all familiar with the fact that religions have as a matter of course, down through the span of human history, religions have concerned themselves with enlightenment. It's even been carried to the point of caricature. Janet and I have spent a few days being very lazy, which included watching television in Northern California. And those of you who have been equally indolent may be familiar with a a TV ad for yellow pages. And in that TV ad, some poor soul climbs a mountain, finds an individual who is some kind of guru and a source of enlightenment, and seeks guidance from him on how all information can be obtained, and this enlightened soul refers him to the yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> so be that as it may, and the attainment of enlightenment has been the goal of religions. Our religion is distinctive in two ways with regard to enlightenment. One is the fact that to us the ideal state is dynamic, not static. We differ radically from the ideal state expressed in various religions, the paradise of a static condition, the uh, sense of attaining an enlightenment where one is basically static and unchanging. The other distinctive characteristic of our approach to enlightenment is the fact that we see fulfillment and enlightenment not exclusively in solitary pursuits, but through interaction with others in service or consultation or some form of cooperation. To us, the enlightened state includes that service-oriented or cooperatively-oriented interaction with other human beings. I want to spend a few minutes dwelling on some of the characteristics that I see in the Baha'i faith which pertain to enlightenment. There is a rather obvious hidden motive here. 
I'm deliberately selecting those characteristics which will be of value to me later in my talk. I'm deliberately selecting things which are universally applicable later when I talk about the educated Baha'i or the Baha'i again engaged in scholarly pursuits. I will refer back to them and I will say as politely as possible, see those things about enlightenment are still applicable even if you are involved in education or scholarship. Hopefully it won't be too terribly obvious, but it'll be along those lines. <laughs> One of the characteristics of the enlightened individual, as I see it in the teachings, is that he or she has an open-minded attitude to lifelong learning. And I see this as a requirement imposed upon all Baha'is, irrespective of whether they are literate or illiterate the attitude of learning. I have had a close experience in contact with illiterate Baha'is and I notice how in many instances their attitude to learning is highly developed. Learning from experience, learning from observation of nature, learning from interaction with others and has reinforced my view that our teachings say to all of us, irrespective of any considerations, we should commit ourselves to lifelong learning. Obviously this includes formal, but it doesn't only re restrict itself to formal learning. The House of Justice, in a recent letter, said devotion to learning has been an integral feature of Baha'i life and belief from the beginning. And as you well realize, in the recently concluded five-year plan and the one on which we are now embarked, learning is integral. Learning by experience, by reflection, by revision of plans for the next cycle or whatever, it is stitched in to the very concept of Baha'i community activity. Le this learning, of course, requires an open-minded attitude as intrinsic to it, but that open mind attitude doesn't carry to extremes. It's one thing to be open-minded, it's another thing to be gullible and naive and to believe all kinds of strange things which turn out to be superstitious or totally irrational or the like. So there are extremes in the approach to open-mindedness and we are advised in our writings to avoid the extreme of gullibility and naivety. Obviously, it's a very complicated subject because a lot of great scientific discoveries have appeared quite bizarre in their original form. I remember the person who first uh, discovered the concept of continental drift and how difficult it was for him to find a reputable journal which would publish it. Now, eventually, I think it was the South Dakota Journal of Mines or something, which was quite obscure at that time. We're told also that the uh, enlightened individual's attitudes include those of a constant striving for progress and the achievement of excellence. Again, applicable to all Baha'is, literate or illiterate. This sense of aspiration, the sense of wanting to improve oneself, wanting to improve one's performance in whatever activity one is engaged in. And concomitant with that, a sense of humility in relation to others. These are, in the larger society, often mutually exclusive. Those who aspire to excellence seem to feel it necessary to discard humility along the way 
as a means of buttressing their self-concept of excellence. And that certainly is not part of our religion. We're told also that the aspiration to enlightenment should include respect for the accomplishment of others, constant encouragement of others toward aspiration. And in my brief and highly subjective survey of the Baha'i concept of enlightenment, it seems to me that one should mention also that the enlightened Baha'i in our religion is one whose exalted aims and aspirations do not exclude him or her from engaging in the life and activities of the community, including its mundane aspects. We are quite removed from the person who is so involved in the pursuits of abstract algebra or the mysteries of the general theory of relativity that he or she cannot bring themselves to help to set the table or do the dishes or to help to weed the garden or something like that. Abdul Baha remains as always our shining example, not only of the profundity of his wisdom, the nature of his personal characteristics, but his lack of inhibition about involving himself in the mundane aspects of the life. We have many rich examples of Abdul Baha in Akka and in Haifa and how readily and in such good spirit he participated in the mundane aspects of the life of the community and service to others. And of course, as you can well imagine, the enlightened individual is one who retains and in fact fosters an appropriate degree of respect for the authority of Baha'i institutions. To us in this room it seems obvious. Why are we wasting time talking about it? It's not so obvious out there because so often in the larger society there are individuals who feel that for certain reasons they don't have to follow what everybody else follows. They are too important, too significant, they have too, uh, uh, their characteristics are such that they can either dispute with the institutions or disregard them. We are, as you well realize, a work in progress as a Baha'i community. As such, we fall down from time to time, we don't pretend not to make mistakes and errors but we do say that we learn from them, we try not to make the same mistakes over and over again, and that there is overall progress. Along those lines, one finds that occasionally some of our shortcomings include the sense of a segment of the Baha'i community feeling it is immune from the requirements of some aspects of enlightenment, such as humility, such as engaging in mundane aspects of life, immune for various spurious reasons. For example, because of wealth. Those Baha'is who are wealthy sometimes feel, well, we can get someone else to do that, but not me. In fact, I'll pay you to do it if you really want to. Or Baha'is of social status, of high social status, who feel that, in fact, it would be demeaning of their status, of their prestige in the larger society. Sometimes it is a matter of family lineage. Having a distinguished ancestor or a relative somehow seems to confer some kind of aura in the minds of the individual that he or she doesn't have to do what the rest of us are doing. And sometimes it's a matter of education that educated individuals should not have to concern themselves with all the trivia that the rest of us are dealing with. These are 
the characteristics of the enlightened individual and as I say, there has been a deliberate purpose in my mentioning them because they, I think, pertain to what I want to say as I continue about education and scholarship. Let me now proceed to education. Before I do that, let me see if somebody can give me a glass of water at some point because uh, having drunk so much Starbucks coffee this morning, I probably <laughs> need some water before I get too far along here. Fine, I, can, I don't need it right now. People can use it as an excuse. <laughs> People are using it as an excuse to flee from the room, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how many of them come back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk about education. Education is under great stress in many parts of the world for a variety of reasons. It is not a popular subject to legislators and those who allocate the national resources of a country. The lack of funding means that as you travel around the world you see schools and universities, the fabric of which is deteriorating. They're not in very good shape as far as buildings go. Salaries of teachers at high school, and primary high school and tertiary levels are low and not keeping up with inflation. Fees are rising astronomically in many countries and excluding capable students from education. There is an ongoing pressure for grade inflation, pressure to give good grades to people and a greater percentage of the students to get very high grades. There's a pressure to produce courses of lower standard so that grades can correspondingly be better. The system shows signs of corruption, an increase in cheating, the bribery of teachers concomitant or together with the low salaries that teachers get, the downloading of essays from the internet, bullying and violence in schools, violence towards fellow students and toward teachers. One of the very significant stresses in the educational system is that the purpose of education is presented largely in terms of its income potential in making a decision about whether to proceed to advanced education, what course to follow and whether to continue in it. The argument is largely in our society presented in terms of if you do this, you will get more income and it will average out ahead of the rest of the population over the course of several decades. This argument is of course weak. It doesn't work anymore. People who go into non-educative disciplines generally end up making more money than our poor souls who struggle for so many years to get a master's degree or a PhD. So it raises the question in the minds of a lot of people in our society, what is the purpose of education? Why should I expose myself to a system which is increasingly corrupt, which doesn't have a financial payoff? For people of a religious background, such as we are, additional questions arise about education. They don't apply to the entire Baha'i community, but one does meet from time to time Baha'is who raise one or more of these questions. There are those who are deeply concerned that if their young people embark upon education in a secular setting, 
it will weaken their faith. That they should not study psychology because if they study psychology it rests upon the material concept of, of human nature it will take them away from religion. They should not study philosophy or economics or sociology or history or whatever because it will weaken their, their religious faith. There are those perhaps not many of them hopefully who feel that religion contains all the knowledge one needs, that as is quoted in the Hadith in the kitab i khan knowledge is a point that the ignorant have multiplied and that by pursuing education in a secular setting, one is exposing oneself to this multiplication of ignorance. There are some of us who, from this recurs from time to time in various parts of the world who have an apocalyptic view of the imminence of catastrophe. And that apocalyptic view of the imminence of catastrophe feeds into the fact why bother with education when the whole rotten mess is going to blow up anyhow. <laughs> and that then becomes a pressure on young people not to engage in long-term commitment of an educational nature. And there are also, most recently, with the last few years, with the uh, uh, legitimate pressure for the uh, core activities to be expanded and developed in the five-year plan, there are those extremists who say that things are so urgent at this time that you should abandon your long-term pursuits, educational or otherwise, because we have to get this 1,500 intensive programs of growth, of growth. Nothing is more important than that. Give up whatever else you're doing. Let's just do this. And after that, maybe if there's time, you can go and do your education. So there are these various pressures which apply within the Baha'i setting beyond those that I had, to which I have drawn attention of the deterioration of the structure of education and the facilities in the larger society. We have to look at all of this from the perspective of authentic Baha'i teachings, not from what people tell us, this is what you should do and this is what's unpublished or this is what I know the House of Justice said but it hasn't said it out loud, all this kind of stuff. We have to... <laughs> We have to avoid all these things. We have to root our faith in authentic Baha'i teachings which can readily be examined and the accuracy of which discerned. And we know that there is some accuracy in these various concerns that certain Baha'is have expressed. There is some accuracy in the fact that one's faith can be weakened by secular education but this, it is intrinsically an inaccurate statement. As we'll see, it presently the contrary applies. The Guardian's writings refer to the reinforcement, the mutual reinforcement between insight in the teachings and secular education. There is some truth that things are in a mess and getting a lot worse, but our sense of the transition in society is of two processes of decline and growth punctuated by events of a calamitous nature rather than in the apocalypse as it's conventionally expressed. As regards the pressure of the moment, the needs of the five-year plan and the like, these are legitimate concerns. The House of Justice messages, including its Rizvan message and that of 27 December 2005, do quite properly call attention to the pressing needs for concerted action on the part of Baha'is all over the world in pursuit of the core activities, in uh, developing clusters which can sustain and maintain intensive programs of growth. 
But these messages also distinguish between priority and exclusivity. And the failure to make the distinction between priority and exclusivity is leading to distortions. We know where the priorities lie, the five-year plan, the message of the House of Justice. We can't think of any other way to say it more clearly than we are saying. And the House of Justice does not call for exclusivity. Friends here at this conference have spoken to me privately and asked me with great sincerity, is it all right to continue to have firesides? Who am I to say no? Who is the House of Justice to abrogate something laid down by Shoghi Effendi so forcefully as the need for individual teaching, for firesides, for proclamation, for student activities on campus, for all the other things that make Baha'i life rich and meaningful? Beyond that, anybody who has experience in enterprises, whether they are business enterprises, organizations of various kinds, industrial activities, or anything like that, anyone with experience in that knows that exclusive focus on the short-term needs is the way to doom. Any enterprise be it a Baha'i administrative enterprise or otherwise, that focuses only on the short term is doomed to be storing up trouble for itself in the future. We have to, with intelligent minds, devote priority to the short term, but not to neglect the long term. Otherwise, we will find ourselves in a few years' time lacking the resources to meet the emergent needs of the faith in years to come. Over the several decades to which Eric has so delicately referred to my Baha'i activities, over the, these several decades, which extends now to about five decades, I have noticed believers who have become so and obsessed, if you will, with the short term in terms of their service to the needs of the faith that they neglected the long term in their personal development. As a result, they found that after 10 years, they were unemployable. They could not serve the faith. They didn't have the skills, they didn't have the, the long-term development, they didn't have the orientation. All they could do is continue to play the theme they had played, which was applicable 10 years ago and was obsolete now. So the focus on the long-term as well as the short-term is very crucial. The Baha'i teachings, as I read them, indicate to me a very surprising emphasis on education and the acquisition of knowledge. I read again and again statements to that subject. Baha'u'llah says, knowledge is one of the wondrous gifts of God. It is incumbent upon everyone to acquire it. One is afraid to open a dictionary and look up the meaning of the word incumbent. <laughs> because Baha'u'llah says it is incumbent upon everyone to acquire it. He says, or Abdul Baha says, to promote knowledge is thus an inescapable duty imposed on every one of the friends of God. These and many other statements, I think, should be considered very carefully by any Baha'i planning the course of his or her life. Those plans should accommodate the strength of the statements of 
Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha and the Guardian on the duty, the incumbency placed upon the individual to pursue the acquisition of knowledge. The writings contain other statements pertinent to this subject of education, pertinent to the fact of why we're getting education when you can make much more money as a, uh, well, I don't know, there's probably some people in the room doing that, so whatever <laughs> measure. <laughs> You can make a lot of money as a mafia hitman. I presume there's none of those in the room. <laughs> a very insightful statement from Baha'u'llah in Tablets After the Kitab Yaktas, where he says, knowledge is a veritable treasure for man and a source of glory of bounty, of joy, of exaltation, of cheer and gladness unto him. Most significant statement where Baha'u'llah is telling us that the acquisition of knowledge is a source of joy, cheer and gladness. Fundamentally, one of our basic reasons for the pursuit of education is that it is a source of happiness. Not particularly around exam time, maybe not when the results come out, but overall, in the course of one's life, the life devoted to the acquisition of knowledge to the pursuit of education in its broadest as well as its narrow formal sense, therein lies fulfillment, contentment, as Baha'u'llah says, gladness and joy. And Shoghi Effendi is quite unequivocal in relating effectiveness of teaching the cause to this matter. He says in one place, or his secretary on his behalf, if the Baha'is want to be really effective in teaching the cause, they need to be much better informed, able to discuss intelligently and intellectually the present condition of the world and its problems. And these are just a selection of many, many passages. Most everything I'm reading is either from the compilation on scholarship or a, a, a supplementary compilation on issues pertaining to the study of the cause, both of which are published in recent years. In that sense, our answer to the concern about should I get education or not is refer to the writings, refer to what it says about the importance of education, its value in uh, uh, the teaching of the faith, its personal reward in terms of happiness, joy, contentment, gladness and cheer, as Baha'u'llah says. The Universal House of Justice from time to time receives letters from very sincere and devoted believers who say, please tell me what are the disciplines in which the cause has a particular need and I'll study one of them. These letters touch us. They, they are moving. They represent the devotion of a believer who's willing to put himself or herself in the hands of the head of the faith and saying, I will do anything you like. If you tell me to go and study astrophysics, I'll study astrophysics. If you tell me to go and study archaeology, I'll study archaeology. I want to do whatever will meet the needs of the faith at the present time. The most common response of the House of Justice, and there is no universal response because uh, things do change, but the most common response of the House of Justice follows the response given by Shoghi Effendi to similar questions. 
there is a passage where the guardian, through his secretary, said, concerning the course of study you may follow, the cause is such that we can serve it no matter what our profession may be. The only necessity is that we be spiritually minded and not be guided by purely material considerations. And of course, if one's orientation is toward the service of the faith as the dominant consideration, then that transcends material considerations. It seems to me that one should therefore not feel narrowly constrained in the subject one chooses to pursue in education. Obviously, one has to consider employment because it is very frustrating to go through a course of study of several years and then find that there are no employment possibilities for it and that one then has to change one's, one's line of work and one feels rightly or wrongly that much of the, the effort has been wasted. That generally is not the case, but nevertheless it is a source of disappointment. So one should legitimately give some due weight to the possibility of education. One should consider, of course, one's own talents and opportunities. There are so many dear Baha'i friends in other parts of the world, particularly the third world, who yearn for education, struggle to get opportunities, and often are disappointed. So it's no use going to them and preaching to them about thou must go and get an advanced education when these poor souls are struggling to find the resources and the opportunities to acquire any kind of education. So those of us who have opportunities are in that sense privileged and need to take advantage of it. There are special needs in the cause which arise from time to time. I want to mention a few of them but I should also caution you that these needs do change with the passage of time. At the moment, for example, the World Centre is desperately in need of certain kinds of people which we can't find. We need people, for example, to help our International Baha'i Library make a much needed quantum leap forward in its functioning. We need people with Master of Library Science with a specialization in informatics so that we can use the uh, cutting edge informatics to develop the International Baha'i Library. We need archivists who have a skill in modern technology for archival, for information retrieval and the like. We have a desperate need for people in conservation, in conservation science. Yeah, one meets so many people who have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and say, what can I do with my bachelor's degree in chemistry? One of the things you can do is do uh, post bachelor's degree work in conservation science and help us at the international level or at the national level and the like to conserve the precious documents of the faith, the paper documents, the tablets, the uh, authentic writings, the uh, uh, historical documents of the faith, and beyond that, conservation in its broader sense of object conservation the conservation of textiles, the conservation of sacred artefacts, and of course of holy place buildings. There are needs at the Baha'i World Center in uh, the engineering disciplines of uh, uh, facility maintenance, of the cutting edge facilities at the, on the ark and of the various professional trades and so on. These are needs at the moment they may not be needs in five years' time. We don't want you to put all your eggs in one basket and say, I'll train for this, because you may find that the needs have 
changed with the passage of time, but they are certainly very legitimate and very pressing needs, and I suspect they're needs that are going to be intrinsic to the Baha'i world for decades in the future, because what we do at the World Center in terms of uh, um, library and archival development and the like will later be translated to similar activity in the larger national communities and then the smaller national communities all over the world. We're told in our faith that one of the important parameters in the acquisition of education is the need to always give preeminence to the authority of the manifestation of God. The House of Justice says, in the simultaneous endeavor to pursue their studies and to delve deeply into the Baha'i teachings, believers are enjoined to maintain a keen awareness that the revelation of Baha'u'llah is a standard of truth against which all other views and conclusions should be measured. This is certainly very, very important because as, you, as the words say, the revelation is the standard of truth. There are lots of things out there which are an accepted part of secular education. Some of them conform to the Baha'i teachings, some of them don't. When we find things that don't conform to the Baha'i teachings, we should not allow ourselves to be shaken in our faith. We should not become obnoxious towards our teachers and adopt a position of superiority and try and educate them in what Baha'u'llah says, because that's pretty counterproductive apart from obnoxious. But, uh, <laughs> At the same time, we should not allow our faith to be in any way disturbed. Having said that, I think one needs to be very careful of this subject. There are many aspects of the Baha'i teachings where one has to be very careful to avoid rushing too quickly to judgment. For example, astrophysics. There's been some, probably still is some controversy in the astrophysical community about whether the origin of the universe is a steady state creation or a big bang. And our writings speak of creation as being without beginning and without end. That being so, I think we have to be very wary of rushing to conclusions and saying Baha'is support the steady state model rather than the Bing Bang model. Both models are still work in progress. Both will probably be refined. Other models may emerge. I think we have to be cautious on this regard. With the innumerable letters have come to the House of Justice in recent years about cloning. And what do we say about cloning? And the response of the House of Justice, as I understand it, has been very, very cautious. Basically saying, let's see how things develop, let's see how, what science uncovers. There are a number of issues that are yet obscure. It has refrained from making any kind of dogmatic uh, or ex cathedra statements on cloning because it is a very, very complex subject. The same applies to the question of evolution. And of course, we've had this very excellent discussion here at this conference and in relating the, uh, the various theories of evolution and intelligent design vis-a-vis -vis Darwinian evolution and the like. And I think that's very good because there is an element of care and caution, a refusing to rush to judgment or to adopt a narrow perspective or too quickly rushing to say, well, that's wrong because it's contradicted by Baha'u'llah. And the same, of course, applies in, uh, 
evaluation of theories of psychology or of sociology or indeed of economics. Obviously, we have a different perspective on the nature of man, which affects those disciplines, yet at the same time, those disciplines have so much to offer of validity. I have uh, made a brief reference, and I won't dwell on it too much, but you'll find in these two compilations to which I have referred that the uh, Guardian has developed at some length in some of the passages of his, his writings the reciprocal, mutually reinforcing relationship between secular knowledge and insight into the Baha'i teachings. There are instances where he refers to the fact that study of subjects such as sociology, history, economics and the like, and I think they're no more than examples, provides insight into the Baha'i teachings. And then there are other passages where he says the exact opposite. He says that study of the Baha'i teachings provides insight into the secular disciplines of history, economics and sociology and the like. And I think far beyond the concern about education weakening one's faith is the fact that if it is pursued in an appropriate manner by believers who are strongly rooted in their religion, far from weakening their faith, it reinforces it it gives insights of mutual benefit, seeing deep, more deeply aspects in, of the teachings and also being able to contribute new insights to those secular disciplines. I wanted, to, before I leave education, to draw your attention to the strength of the Guardian's admonitions to us to the acquisition of education. And I can do this no more effectively by reading to you a statement of the Guardian which I find quite astonishing. He says, it is just as important for Baha'i young boys and girls to become properly educated in colleges of high standing as it is to be spiritually developed. The mental as well as the spiritual side of the youth has to be developed before he can serve the faith, the cause efficiently. There's a wealth of information in that passage which is not gained by my reading it so quickly. Its first sentence almost borders on heresy. <laughs> Here is the guardian of the cause, no less, saying it is just as important, just as important for Baha'i young boys and girls to become properly educated in colleges of high standing as it is to be spiritually developed. It's an incredible statement. And you can't say, well, that was what he said on that day to that particular person. There's a generality to the statement and it's reinforced by many other statements we have in the letters of the Guardian. And then, of course, the second sentence is uh, equally significant. The mental as well as the spiritual side of youth has to be developed before it can serve the cause efficiently. We can all serve the cause. We ought to try and one way or t'other. To do it efficiently is something else. And the Guardian is here pointing to the balance between the intellectual or mental development and the spiritual development in order that this efficiency may come into being. Let me move on because time is rushing by. And two other things I want to speak about. The Next subject I want to address briefly is the subject of scholarship and this can be brief because a lot of things have been said and a lot of things have been clarified in recent years. However, there are some issues that have come up in recent 
months and years that I've become aware of in my functioning, my present functioning as a member of the House of Justice. Quest these are some of the questions that I notice believers are asking. Firstly, should faithful believers persist in intellectual inquiry and scholarship when it has attracted such controversy and questioning of provisions of the covenant. I think we all know that there's been this controversy and who are in the, uh, on the internet and various other places uh, occasionally intruding into some of the letters of the House of Justice of individuals who have uh, purported to be part of the scholarly Baha'i community and are questioning the covenant and raising all sorts of issues and probably saying very nasty things about some of us and the like. And so one raises the question, is it not better to stay away from the whole thing for a few years until it all calms down because I don't want to be a source of controversy and contention. Maybe this is not a good time to go into Baha'i scholarly activity. Another question is, is it not self-indulgent or irrelevant to engage in Baha'i scholarship when there is so much emphasis on the advancing the process of entry by troops and the core activities of the plan. And thirdly, how can unquestioned faith and the validity of the teachings be reconciled with the inquiry and investigation that's part of scholarly activity? These are questions I notice that have been raised by very, very sincere believers. They're questions people are asking. They're questions that are unequivocally answered by authoritative Baha'i writings of recent years, and particularly with the authority of the Universal House of Justice. The faith has, without any equivocation, emphasized the continuing need for Baha'i scholarly activity. Again and again, we have passages for, from the Guardian and from the House of Justice which say without any hesitation, we want more Baha'is to be engaged in scholarly activity. Don't hold back, don't run away, don't feel afraid that it will disturb the, your adherence to the covenant or that you'll be a source of headache and difficulty and, and nuisance to the Baha'i community. Go for it. Be part of the Baha'i scholarly community. The House of Justice has said in a recent letter, or a letter written on its behalf by its secretariat, the Universal House of Justice regards Baha'i scholarship as of great potential importance for the development and consolidation of the Baha'i community as it emerges from obscurity. And that statement of the House of Justice, I think, is without qualification and it does no more than reiterate statements made equally as strongly by the Guardian. So those who have some concern should not do so. At the same time, obviously, they should be smart and intelligent. They should make themselves strong in the covenant. They should become steadfast believers in the cause. They should immerse themselves deeply in the provisions of the covenant, understand it at a deep fundamental level so nothing can shake them and the nasty statements that somehow that sometimes appear on the internet will not be a source of spiritual disturbance to them. The second question of self-indulgence in relation to the core activities, I think I have referred to, and I will refer to it again presently, but certainly I, it is not self-indulgent. We do need Baha'i scholarly activity, just as we do need the priority to the core activities of the plan. It is not either or, it is both together. The third question of unquestioned faith in the validity of the teachings reconciled with inquiry and investigation is again addressed in the writings of the faith 
the preeminence of the authority of Baha'u'llah together with the use of the rational process to explore, to acquire deeper insight. The writings, and particularly now the statements of the House of Justice, have emphasized, and this has been uh, taken from a very long letter addressed to this North American Association for Baha'i Studies, so I don't need to dwell on it too much. Ha the House of Justice addressing this association has said, among other things, that no attempt should be made to define too narrowly the form that Baha'i scholarship should take. There are all kinds of people and they should be encouraged to do all kinds of things. The House has called for the mutual respect and tolerance and that Baha'i scholarship should embrace those whose principal interest is in theological issues as well as those whose interest lies in relating the faith to the contemporary thought in the arts and sciences. Again, all together rather than either or. Certainly the Guardian has referred to the need to correlate the teachings with current thought in uh, various disciplines. That's certainly true. It does not allow us then to denigrate the work of those who are carrying out very important activities of a more theological nature or even of a more abstract nature, all together mutually supportive rather than why are you doing that instead of this or that's unimportant and this is important. I remember uh, many, many years ago I was exposed to an iniquitous subject called prote projective geometry and Councillor Agdasi made some reference in his talk yesterday or whatever to non-Euclidean geometries. This was one of those non-Euclidean geometries resting upon a series of axioms, none of which made sense. For example, one of the um, elements of projective geometry, one of the axioms, is that parallel lines meet at a point called syzygy, which is an interesting word without any vowels in it, uh, meet at a point of syzygy. Well, eh, what, two? What's that two mean? <laughs> two minutes, okay. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm gonna, uh, I hate to break the news to you, but I'm gonna take a little more than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, point of syzygy. And uh, I exposed myself to projective geometry. I struggled with it. And I decided that I obviously needed to acquire the insight into it. Lo and behold, after many hundreds of years of development of projective geometry down through the Middle Ages, it turns out to be of vital importance in certain areas of uh, of uh, astrophysics and radio astronomy, things and the like. So we have to be very, very careful of condemnation of anything of a scholarly nature. Finally, let me move on to the uh, saying a few words about global civilization. And I don't have much to say, so we can keep Erica and. Uh, uh, like reasonably happy, not very, but reasonably. <laughs> you might well say, why is global civilization being mentioned essentially in the same breath as education and scholarship? Our writings indicate that there is a sequence to the development of the world in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. The establishment of the lesser peace that we're working towards. We have the unity of nations. We're in, uh, engaged in, in the process of evolution to the lesser peace. This will lead to the emergence of a new world order and the establishment of the most great peace. And the Guardian says, then will a world civilization be born and flourish. 
Well, that's a long way down the road. Even the youngest of us will be an old fossil by that time. So why are we concerned with global civilization at this time? We do so because of an intriguing statement of Shoghi Effendi, where he says that, uh, where he refers in Promised Days Come to the administrative order of the faith, and he says, within this administrative structure, an embryonic civilization incomparable and world embracing is imperceptibly maturing. The world civilization is off into the future, but its embryo is within the present administrative order, and therefore it is both legitimate and important that we give some thought to it in this context. In order to do that, and this really is the final point, I keep saying this to Erica, it isn't quite the final point, but let's keep her happy. Um, in order to, uh, to foster this global civilization, there are three things that I want to recommend we do. The first is a very obvious one, development of our spiritual attitudes, because that's the foundation of civilization, as I think uh, Beru Sabet in his excellent presentation on secret and divine civilization yesterday afternoon referred to the nature of civilization described by Abdul Baha. Certainly, our spiritual attitude is foundation to that. Our personal conduct, our uh, development of manners. Uh, I'm showing such terrible manners to my, my uh, organizers, but everyone else should show good manners, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Development of manners, courtesy, cleanliness, neatness of dress. That's one aspect of global civilization we're required to work on right now. The second one is the scholarship aspect. We need more Baha'i scholarship in anything you can possibly think of because that will enrich us as part of the development of the embryo of world civilization for the future. And finally, and most controversially, I want to encourage all of us who are centered in scholarly activities not to neglect the core activities of the plan. It doesn't mean you have to become superman or superwoman and work 25 or 26 hours a day. What I'm saying is that those of us whose passion is scholarly activity should also be aware that that scholarly activity relates very directly to the core activities. How does it relate to the core activities? It does so because intrinsic to the core activities is the Baha'i attempt to solve a problem which has defied the power of every religion for the past 6,000 years. For 6,000 years, the followers of religion have tried and failed to break down the dichotomy between a few hyperactive, overworked leaders and a mass of followers who are required to be passive, to follow orders, to sit there and be quiet and do what you're told. This is not what the Baha'i faith is about. The Baha'i faith is about an active community of people who are actively involved at every level in decision making, in creative thinking, in exploring the teachings. No such community has ever existed in the religious history of humanity and we need to establish it. If we don't, things will not work. The administrative order will not function. 
the Baha'i electoral process will become ossified unless we solve this problem. If we do solve it, it will take us decades. The core activities of the five-year plan with the participatory element, with the lack of an authoritative guru to guide the, the, the consultation, represents a major commitment on the part of the faith to break down the false dichotomy between the hyperactive leader and the hyperpassive congregation. And I think it is important that Baha'is of a scholarly orientation contribute to this if for no other reason than it will result in a vast increase in the manpower of the faith as a matrix from which will come the future scholars and the future scholarly endeavors. It is therefore a matter not only of the needs of the cause, it is a matter of basic self-interest. Those of us who are interested in the scholarly pursuits of the faith out of a matter of self-interest, our adherence, our support of the core activities to the faith will produce the new generation of scholars, the new generation of intellectual activity, of fertility, of creative thought, of innovation, which will make the Baha'i community alive, dynamic, full of energy and fresh thinking and contribute to the richness of the cause. And I'm leaving before they throw me out. Thank you.